everybody, welcome to Performance Anxiety. I'm your host, Mark, and I want to thank our sponsor, AKG, for sending us their Podcast for Essentials kit, which has this amazing lemur mic and these great headphones. If you've ever thought about doing your own podcast, this is the best way to get into it. If you're a fan of shoegaze, this show is meant for you. My guest is KJ Moose McKillop of the Shoegaze Pioneers Moose, but more recently of the non supergroup Peroshka. The Moose is the band that spawned the term shoegaze, or rather the term was spawned during one of their first live performances. If you don't know that story, definitely need to go look it up. Moose talks about how the band changed their sound from shoegaze pretty early on. He also talks about meeting Jeff Buckley in Atlanta and his longtime connection with Mickey Berenge and Lush. After a long hiatus, Moose formed the band Peroshka with Mickey, Justin Welch of Elastica, and Michael Conroy of Modern English. Follow Peroshka for news about their upcoming release and some possible tour dates. Follow us at Performance ANX. Rate and review us to help us meet some new listeners. And we love it when you buy us a cup of coffee at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety. Merch is available at performanceanx.threadless.com. So grab a pint and some snacks as we revisit some amazing times with Moose McKillop on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. I'm just going to make sure I don't fuck up, you know. Okay, so you're listening to uh, Moose from Moose and also from Peroshka now. And um, I've been talking to Mark on Performance Anxiety. Hope you've enjoyed it. Oh, no. Oh, hang on. I hope you've enjoyed it means that comes at the end. Do you want something for the beginning? <laughs> I uh, went to use the bathroom real quick and the toilet seat broke. Oh. So, <laughs> so I'm like, ah. This may be a little too much, but I sat down all of a sudden, the whole thing just went. And they're, not, they're not built to last. No, nothing is. No, they're, 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 no, absolutely. Talk about built in obsolescence. Yeah. <laughs> like your phone, my computer. <laughs> It's everything around us. I mean, the, everything I'm looking at now, all the tech, it, 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 in about 10 years' time, it'll all be in landfill. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know. Absolutely. Um, it's it's, it's oh. a horrible thought. It really is. I mean, I, I don't know. Before we get too far into things, I just I want to thank you for, for doing this, man. This is, uh, this is awesome. I'm really thrilled to, to have you on. Uh, absolute pleasure, honestly, really. And um, it's been a long time coming. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. but the, the, good, the good thing is, you know, there's a lot to talk about, really, because have we started? Oh, yeah. I, as soon as oh, okay, I, that's good. That's, I do the Neil Young approach, as soon as we connect, I start recording. Okay. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> um, because we've um, something I mentioned to you a while ago, maybe about a box set. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the ball has started rolling on that now, yes. so which is really good because um, it's just lovely of Simon to and Belly Union to want to do it in the first place because they were never really involved in with us. You know, we we were on several labels, right. um, but he's he's determined to sort of get everything together in one package. Oh, that's um, awesome! Yeah, I'm so um, happy to hear about that. Yeah, so that's that's it's going to take a while because. Heart Records, I think they they was Virgin. They're now owned by Universal, I think. Oh. And there's all kinds of stuff that's probably just in you know in in some office basement somewhere covered in dust that yeah. you know nobody knows how to access. Well, that's got to um, be the thing. How that's got to be so hard to track down a bunch of that stuff. Yeah, because we did um, uh, we did. What, what did we do? We did a few EPs on Hut Records, then one album, then we did a single on our own label. Right. Then we did then we're on Play It Again Sam for a couple of albums. Then I think the the last album came out on Le Grand Magistry in the States. Okay. Um so, so that's you know, that's already we're already into four labels here. Yeah. Um uh, I yeah, and I I don't know if you're anything like me, but if you know, on your your own stuff, it's almost as hard to find as somebody else's label having it. <laughs> yeah. If you told me, hey, go find this picture you took, you know, 15 years ago, like, oh shit. But one of the uh, the ways I like to start things off is to find out about how you got into music. Was guitar your first instrument, and were, was there a lot of music playing in the house? Was what was what was getting into music as a kid? 
there was a lot of music in the house. Um, uh, I grew up in um, quite a typical Irish um, working class family. So it, it, I grew up with what everyone, all my, all other kind of like English born Irish background people call country and Irish. Okay. Um, with plenty of Elvis thrown in on top. So it was it was a typical a typical Sunday would be my mum playing I don't know folk music like um, whether it was things that were well known like the Dubliners or mm. the Chieftains or Plank Steel or lots of uh, traditional music. Christy Moore. And then, no, actually, really, I think, yeah, he he would be a bit he would be a bit mainstream. She was really wow. I mean really traditional instrumental music you know like oh, wow. you know like pipes pipes and fiddles and that kind of thing and then my dad it was johnny cash and elvis and uh, that was the mix i'll tell you the mix uh, was that, that thing uh, yeah. so, so your dad was into johnny cash and elvis John, yeah that kind of thing uh, my dad was one of these again uh, i don't want to sort of you know get too cliched but a lot of irish guys they they like their westerns their cowboy novels yeah. um you know that kind of stuff it was into that kind of mythology really of you know the, the old west oh yeah um, so that that kind of that the, any any music that referenced that country music um that was his thing so country and irish is is a is a, a thing that people recognize almost as a as a kind of a musical lifestyle of the 70s i, th I think that there might be something in the uh, gene pool with that because my dad uh, you know i'm i'm I don't know, 90% Irish. So my dad was the same way. It really still is. You know, he's, he loves country music, old, old country music, you know, yeah. Waylon Jennings, Willie. And, uh, he loves the traditional Irish stuff too. I mean, it's just, and the movies he loves, he loves the spaghetti Westerns and, and yes. Yeah. It must be something just, in the DNA. I, I think so. I think so. There's just, I think that there's something so romantic about it as well. The Irish you wanderlust. Know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that that uh, diaspora that you, everywhere you go, yeah. you know, there's, you'll find an Irish pub or an Irish bar. I mean, you could be in the outback of Australia or, you know, in some village in New Zealand, and you'll you'll find somebody. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. So that was the that was the, the first kind of music that was in the house. Okay, you know that that um, that we would listen to, and then of course, you know, just having the radio on in the seventies meant you were exposed to, well just all the, all the 70s pop music that went from like glam to disco to just things like abba yeah you know just 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 pure 70s pop music that was always on you know when we were having our breakfast that kind of thing now do you um, remember when growing up cuz you know i was born in 73 and also do you remember growing up in that time period music the, the stations playing a wider variety of music as opposed to things seem to be a lot more pigeonholed now yeah, I, I think. I just don't know I if suppose, I'm imagining that or not. No, I don't think you are. I think obviously the the same with television channels. You know, there are so many radio stations out there. You know, for us there was radio Radio One and Radio Two, BBC <laughs> radio stations, and they just and they did play a variety of pop. You know, you would you would actually hear Elvis. Um, and then you'd hear a disco track and then you'd hear ABBA and then you'd hear all, well, just Gary Glitter or, yeah. you know, the sweet or that kind of thing, Mark Bolan. Um, oh, and then the more, the more com the, yeah. And the, the more commercial uh, side of, of punk, cause you couldn't avoid it, you know, things like the buzzcocks or whatever as, a, as the seventies wore on. Yeah. Um, so the radio was always on. And then I suppose, when did I, I think my, my first instrument I probably got in about 1980, 81. It was just around the time of my 18th birthday. I got uh, a synth, just a little synth, and a bass guitar. Oh, wow. I, 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 I could play nothing. I, I mean, I had no musical training at all. I tried learning the trombone uh, at school. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we, well, we had a, a good school orchestra. Uh, the problem was with an instrument, well, with well, any instrument, you, know, you, you obviously have to practice. But we had a <laughs> we had a rotor for bringing home the, uh, the the instruments from school, the brass instruments. And I think it was like every other weekend or every third Saturday or something, oh, wow. you could take the instrument home for the weekend. But I wasn't allowed to practice because, uh, well, a newbie on a trombone is it's not particularly pleasant. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, when when your dad is suffering from a raging hangover, as my dad always was, <laughs> I was always told to um, to put the fucking thing away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and <laughs> stop, stop. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was ridiculous. <laughs> so after after about it was less than a year. And my music teacher noticed that I wasn't making any progress at all. That that those weekends when I should have been, you know, practicing for four or five hours on a Saturday and the same on a Sunday, it just wasn't happening. Yeah. And um, so I just I gave up. Oh um, gosh. Um, which is a which is a real shame because um, it's a, I, I, it's a lovely instrument and I love brass instruments. But um, oh yeah, uh, yeah. I've got th- I have three brass players in the house. Oh really? Oh my god! Yeah, my my oldest daughter, who's a senior in high school this year, plays the uh, uh, trumpet. My son, who's the middle, he'll be graduating next year. He he plays the tuba, and uh, they they all do marching band too. So he transitions to the uh-huh. sousaphone with a marching band, and then my youngest, uh, who's a sophomore, plays the French horn in band and the uh, mellophone in marching band. How did they all end up? Uh, with brass instruments uh, is it one following the other or you know it, it's kind of funny because I, I i love music i bang around on a guitar but i've had very few lessons uh, don't i can't read music i used to be able to read it a little bit but you know i kind of lost that but i always loved it and i always thought it was really important in development and i wish i had i had gotten lessons and learned more so when in middle school, so like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, the schools will have, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what they call it, but they'll, it's like an open house and the kids can come and just grab an instrument and try to play it. And the right. music teachers are there and they will see if, if anybody has an, a natural proclivity towards one instrument over another. And right. uh, so that my daughter just, they had her try like saxophone and a couple things and she grabbed the trumpet and she actually blew a note and they're like right wow okay uh why don't we why don't we you, you do that so same thing with my my son he won't admit this but i will guarantee you this is what happened he goes to the same thing the following year picks up the tuba because it's funny because he's a <laughs> skinny little guy and the tuba is enormous and he, he's got the um uh, he's got the comedic thing going and he thinks it's going to be funny. Hey, I'll pick up this big tuba. And that's how he ended up playing the tuba. Right. And Maggie, I think she just liked the, the look of the French horn and and she tried a bunch of things. And and I think she didn't want to do the same thing that her sister did and didn't want to do, you know, wasn't even going to come close to doing a tuba. So now it's, it's just kind of crazy. And, And so my house can be a cacophony where are you again in the states i'm in winchester virginia okay yeah 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 about 90 miles literally due west of dc the home of patsy klein okay (laughs) i love patsy klein so i I gotta say that right right yeah me too yeah (laughs) so because i was i was just trying to think about time so so you're this is this isn't a bad time for you is it like this is no 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 this is a great time yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's um, not even eight thirty yet. Yeah, but yeah. So I, I actually, um, uh, I've got a trombone, which oh, wow. uh, uh, somebody gave to me a while back, and I thought, oh, do you know what? I'll get some lessons. Um, I had a couple of lessons, and uh, <laughs> the the guy said, um, you know, you're gonna have to you're, you're gonna have to start from scratch. Oh, I mean, wow. I, I, I mean, really, I the my I just couldn't keep a note going my breathing was awful um he said you know you know this is a long time ago that you you know you were playing a long time ago yeah um and then when (laughs) when lockdown lockdown happened you can imagine what went through my mind i thought okay (laughs) this is this is it this is it now's my time to shine you know a year from now i'll be glenn fucking miller you know (laughs) and honestly we've got we've got a soundproof uh, room in the garden. Oh, nice. um, but we, we, so Ivan's Ivan plays the drums, and so oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so he's got we, we've got a load of gear down there. We've got amps and stuff set up, but oh, it's nice. his drum room, really. So I, I was in there, and um, 
<laughs> I just thought I became so self-conscious. I was aware that it's quite a loud instrument, and even in a, in a even in a relatively well soundproof room, the neighbours are just going to be laughing their fucking asses <laughs> off at, 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 at my. Well, you, you said you know the tuba can has has you know comedy value. Yeah. Well, you know, badly played trombone is is just as. <laughs> hilarious <laughs> catastrophic oh yeah. man so i didn't last very long <laughs> so it strikes again the trombone yeah. strikes again so all right yeah, so yeah. would a guitar really come into play was it just the music that you were starting to gravitate to no the guitar is a weird one really um you know in the early 80s i kind of i you know i tried to form bands um i had a good go i met some nice people nothing really worked out and then kind of 80, 85, 86, I, I was busking on the tube and I had a, an acoustic bass guitar. Um, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I bought an acoustic bass guitar. I was, again, you know, not a great bass player, but, you know, I could bang out a tune. And um, I used to go busking with this Australian guy, Darren, um, who was over in London for a while. And he was a really talented musician and songwriter. But we used to go busking and we'd do um, monkey songs, Beatles songs, oh, um, nice. Doors, just, you know, classic 60s pop tunes. Yeah. Um, and um, then his visa expired and he had to go back to Australia. And, and there I was with a nice 12-string acoustic guitar, completely unable to play it. Oh. And I thought, I, I can't go busking with just an acoustic bass. Right. So I just forced myself. I sat down and over a period of about three or four weeks, I learned just three, four, five chords, you know, just open chords, C, okay. D, E, F, blah, blah, C, D, E, G, C, blah, blah, da, da, da. Right. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a trained, I'm not a, a music student, but right. I could play some open chords, which meant I could play some of the songs that we used to go busking with so I could go out on my own wow. and um, and busk. And so I, it, it was really the, the cliche of like from hunger, you know, it was, um, I was unemployed, busking was um, a way of making money. And uh, I just thought I, I need, to, I really, really need to learn the guitar. Wow. Um, or find somebody else to go busking with, um, which, which is possible, of course, but um, I didn't want to waste any time. So, it, I was driven by uh, the need to kind of just get back out working. Wow. Um, and so uh, that was it. And then, I mean, I, I'm not an accomplished guitarist. I am, um, I can, I can busk. I can strum a little bit. Um, I'm one of these people that are, are, is very happy that effects pedals exist yeah. <laughs> in, their, in their multitude. And um, I love effects pedals. Yeah, so I, I kind of I see it as a tool for writing songs. I think that that's that, that's the guitar for me. It's 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 um, I'm not one of these people that can sit and talk about pickups and yeah. you know I, I just I don't do the tech stuff. If, if it looks nice and it sounds nice, um, I'm happy and that's it really. But by I think I busked for a few more years and really enjoyed it, and then met some other people through busking and we used to go to gigs a lot. But I think. Yeah, that's when I kind of learnt to properly play by having to, um, like I say, I'm no muso at all, <laughs> but to be able to actually just hold a tune for a couple of hours um, and uh, hold a few tunes for a couple of hours and um, make a bit of money on the underground. That helps, man. It, it, was, it inspires it was you. It was it was really good fun. You know, I met, like I said, I met some excellent people and um, I formed a whole new friendship group Okay. Um, see, and that's was, that's just one thing. I don't back. I don't, I'm not sure exactly. Let's see. So you, you're probably what in your late teens or so doing this, early twenties. Uh, I was uh, early. I was yeah, twenty one, twenty twenty one when I started busking. Twenty one, twenty two, early twenties. Yeah. There yeah. is no way I could have done that at that point. I had no confidence in in doing that at all. I didn't have confidence in really anything when i was that age so there's no way i could go out in public and and, and busk i would have just been a disaster so uh, oh I, I i i mean i had disastrous moments <laughs> uh, well it was because um i think uh it was darren actually who um who i think said come on let's just do it you know and, and i i just thought this is insane i'm standing in an underground station right. there's people walking past we've got our guitar cases on the floor for them to throw money into and i'm 
I'm playing and I'm I'm singing and it, and I was nervous. I mean, people are only going to see you for like five, see and hear you for five, ten seconds as they pass you. And, right. Um, you know, you could uh, sometimes you could play the same song for twenty five <laughs> minutes. You know, at the, <laughs> but but it was good because you you perfected. I'm a believer. Right. Or, <laughs> or um, I saw her standing there, or something. You just play the, you you know you'd be playing these songs for hours. Wow. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way, man. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, because they're just walking past, unless because they've got places to go. They're not going to sit there and and listen. No, no, for... Nobody, nobody, nobody ever. There's nobody ever creates an audience. They're just, you know, uh, you just get, you know, a bit of sympathy cash because <laughs> <laughs> you're standing there, you know, looking scruffy as hell, yeah. and um, you know, look, you look like you haven't had a proper meal for a few days. Yeah, and, um, which might be just, true. Well, actually, yes, sometimes. Uh, yeah, you, you, there's no audiences there at all. So, But like I say, it was, it was a good grounding for me because it gave me a bit of confidence. And also, like I say, I suddenly switched from being a bass player, not a very good one, to being a guitarist, an okay one. And then I think, what, the, what was the next step? I... It was from people that I was hanging out with. Oh, gosh, yes, yes. Oh, there's a connection here. The guys I used to go busking with, um, they were art students um, at the Slade in London. Okay. And um, we started going to uh, a club uh, regularly. And it was a club that was run by a Douglas Hart, who was the bass player from the Jesus and Mary chain. He had his own little club night. Oh, this cool. was, again, mid-80s, mid, 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 80s, mid to late 80s. And he used to um, have a regular little club night. It was very small, cozy. Maybe you know, 100 people was a good night. You know, Usually there was 50 or 60 people there. And it was a guy that DJed with him, who was his friend, Stephen. And we got chatting, we made friends, and that's when he's... Me and him, uh, he'd, I think he'd already formed a band called CC Rider, which I then joined on guitar. Oh, wow. So that, was my, that was my first, like, proper band um, after all these years of playing around and jamming around. And suddenly, I was in a band. And, um, and we rehearsed like crazy. And it was, um, it was kind of, uh, it was really good fun. I have yeah. to say more than anything else, I, I'm, you know, the, all the people involved uh, were really, really excellent people. It was uh, one, one of the, one of the guys was a guy that I used to busk with, and Stephen and his girlfriend, and uh, and we had a drum machine. So it was like two guitars, bass, two vocalists, and a drum machine. And um, it was kind of, sort of sleazy, garagey, <laughs> a bit of Velvet Underground. Oh, but, yeah. Um, Kind of just rock and roll, a bit of Bo Diddley. There was a lot of, you know, dang, 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 dang sort of yeah. guitars going on. Uh, there's a lot of Bo Diddley. And kind of, um, it was just, oh, God, I, I have to say, I look back and I think that was that was a happy time. Yeah. That really was. I was <laughs> had no responsibilities. I was in my mid, early to mid-20s, busking, being in a band, and living a fairly cheap lifestyle, but happy poor but happy yeah <laughs> yeah i know that i'm still yeah. poor but you know <laughs> i have more responsibilities than i'm poor <laughs> well this is the thing yeah absolutely yes <laughs> but uh but no response no responsibilities is good but the, the thing is around that time i i decided to um uh, go back into education because i realized that lots of my friends had been to university and i'd skip that okay. thinking that i you know when i you know when i was much younger thinking that oh maybe i i can form a band or something mm -hmm. so i um i um i started uh, a degree course um and i started the degree course the the week literally the week that cc rider did their first gig so we did our first gig I started my degree course and I thought, you know, I have to make a choice here. I can't dick around doing a band anymore. I've, I've got, even though I've done one gig. <laughs> uh, and I had to go to poor old Stephen and Tracy in the band. I said, I, I'm, I'm going to leave because oh. I really want, I really want to concentrate on college and, um, you know, I'm, 25 and i'm starting late you know there were, there were other mature students on the course so i di didn't feel too self-conscious but i just thought i can't do the two things at the same time which was people do yeah um, 
of course. And so I, I left CC Rider <laughs> after the first gig. And um, it, was, it was funny because Phil from Lush, he joined CC Rider after I left. Oh, wow. He did, he, did a few, he did a few gigs with them, actually. I think he did a little tour, Phil King. So he, he joined them for a bit before he was in Lush. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so there's a real overlap of personnel and friendship yeah. groups and and little scenes that I mean everyone kind of knew each other. Uh, you know, it was I mean, London's a big city, but in in certain music scenes, it suddenly becomes a village. You know, you know. Yeah, it's like, yeah, so. yeah. I've, I've heard that a, a lot. You know, you hear about all these. You know what else? It's kind of funny. It's funny how certain things overlap, like you'd said. Then there's also the opposite which is really weird. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I've been incredibly fortunate to interview some amazing people with this podcast. And one was Mark Lanigan. And oh yeah, yeah. when, when he came on, I was, he's in one of my favorite albums of the nineties, mad season. You know, he plays on a couple tracks. He sings on a few tracks. And I asked him about how that formed and, and all. And uh, one of the weird things I discovered was that, so the band is Lane Staley on vocals, uh, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam on guitar, Barrett Martin from Screaming Trees on drums, and this guy John Baker Saunders. Um, I don't even, he was from a jazz outfit, I think. And Mark Lanigan sang on a couple set tracks. Mark had, he had never met Mike McCready before from Pearl Jam. They didn't know each other. And you always hear about how it, it's, it's, it's this big uh, collective, almost incestuous group where everybody knows each other and everybody helps each other out. Yeah. And they hadn't, they'd never met. Wow. I mean, he was best. Now Mark was best friends with, with Lane, which is how he got in. But you know, it's, it's just amazing how in, in some cases people just tend to overlap and, and find themselves together year after year in, in different projects. And then yeah. other people in the same, you know, they're, they're 10 minutes and one band degree of separation from each other and they almost never meet well me and mickey have got a, a funny little story that um when we were together when we first i can't remember whether it was as a as friends or as a couple but i do remember we had a conversation about gigs that we went to in the in the early 80s and um uh russell who's the uh the singer in moose he um he, he told me that he he was at a, a gig once and the gig was a band called the March Violets. They were from Leeds. They were kind of a gothy band, a bit like um, Sisters of Mercy kind of thing. But 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 um, I think they used a drum machine. I think they were a drum machine band. But sort of early early eighties, eighty three, eighty four. Okay. Now I remember I remember going to that gig, and there there were only there were fewer than twelve people in the audience. It was honestly fewer than twelve wow. people. Now it, it transpired that I was there with two or three friends. Mickey was there with two or three friends, and Russell was there with two or three friends. Oh my. And we didn't know each other. So there's one other group of like two or three friends or that three none friends. of you knew. None of you, none of us knew. <laughs> yes, exactly. But it was it was funny because we, we wow. talked about that gig and it was kind of I was at that, there was nobody there. And it was wow. like so was I. There was nobody there. That's and it was a, oh Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's so it's so funny because you know, you do I mean I mean and we're talking literally rubbing shoulders with people because you're jumping around dancing. Yeah. They're, they're perfect strangers. And years later, you know, it's just a kind of a just something that makes you literally laugh out loud. It was just, yeah. I, it was just staggering. I thought, yeah, that we, is amazing. We, we were the audience. That's, gosh. So basically, half of your family was the audience for that show. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. so all right. So you brought up Russell. How did you meet up with Russell and and start playing and and creating the band Moose? Well, here's the the, um, the weird thing. After leaving CC Rider with the um, with the excuse uh, that <laughs> I can't I can't do two things at once, I I I got a part time job at the Record and Tape Exchange, and they they have shops dotted all over West London and one in Camden. And it was it's a real typical studenty job. The guy sells secondhand records and and tapes and whatnot, and um, he only employed students to work there he just assumed that like if you were an undergraduate you were 
intelligent, reliable, and you know you'll you'll get on with it, and you'll just uh, you know you can be trusted. Right. Um, how wrong he was, <laughs> um, but. Um, Mind you, I don't want to say anything that might incriminate me. I um, think but, statute of limitations is probably up. Probably, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but, but, but basically, my first day, uh, my first day there, I was sent to work in one of the shops. I walked in. I said, "Hi, I'm you." And Russell was there. Russell was there, um, and we got chatting. And we had a really good day to, together, just just talking about stuff. We just hit it off immediately. You know, we went and had a beer at lunchtime, and then we started hanging out. And then, I within six months, I think he said, "Let's let's form a band," because he played guitar, and um, let's try and form a band. And and we did. And he, um, you know, he, he took up vocal duties guitar i did guitar we started writing songs together we got some other people in and um i was still a student <laughs> um <laughs> so i i'd kind of gone back on i'd reneged on on my my initial idea that i couldn't do both <laughs> things at the same time because of course you can um but you just discovered a new talent for multitasking Yes. Yes, go. exactly. You're multitasking, <laughs> being a student, working in the record and tape exchange, and being in a band. I actually then, I, 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 suddenly I'm doing three things. And, um... We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. But, yeah. But no, so it was, it was great. It was just, an, it was a, an instant friendship, same taste in music. You know, we, yeah. we, we like the same things. You know, I know that's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that, you know, you, you form a band with people that are, are often into the same music, but it was uncanny that he, he liked, you know, exactly the same things as I did. And well, I mean, uh, yeah, so you that, got that show. <laughs> you said that the, you, the 12 person show, I mean, it was meant yeah. to be. Yeah, ex ex exactly. So it, our kind of history, you know, the things that he liked in the '80s, I liked in the '80s. Yeah. The things that that uh, I mean, now by, by now we're up to what ninety one, ninety. Hang on, eighty nine, ninety. So yeah, we're just moving into the early '90s, and um, it was a good situation to be in because we had a lot of time. You know what it's like when you're a student. There is work to be done, but there's a lot of free time also. Oh yeah. Um, you know, we're in London. We're going to see lots of bands. We've got lots of friends. I mean, one of the the nicest things was um, we when we recorded our first demo, which we definitely did in 1990. I remember it because I was we were in the studio watching some World Cup football, so that was definitely Italia 90. And we um, Russell uh, Russell had been in a relationship with Emma from Lush. Oh, okay. They, very brief you know like i think less than a year um maybe you know six to nine months something like that and she really she was very sweet that i they weren't still together but she took all our demo cassettes we, we copied off i don't 20 <laughs> copies onto a cassette four track demo and she sent them out to creation 4ad and wow. with a little note saying oh this is my ex-boyfriend's band i think you might like this wow um, she was she was great you know i think it was very sweet of her to yeah. kind of she, she just went around and did a bit of you know promotion for us that's amazing um, yeah yeah it was really really lovely and then around the same time i think it, it was either just before or just after we did the demo we got our first gig supporting lush so jeez wow. um, yeah it was just in a weird way it was kind of we almost didn't have to do any work because you know we didn't have to kind of you know, canvas for for support slots. You know, yeah. um, Emma Emma said, "No, no, come on, we're, we're doing we're doing a London show and we're doing a warm up show outside London. Do them both. You know, you uh -huh. can't be the main support for the London show because we've already got they had Swerve Driver as the the support. Oh, so we man. went we went on before and just did twenty twenty five minutes, it's a really short set. Well, we only had. <laughs> really I think we only had about six or seven songs at the time and one of them was a, a cover version of a Roxy Music song oh, um, wow. so, so we didn't have very much to offer at the time but uh, I um, 
This is so weird. Um, I, but I got. I've got to be. I've got to tell. I've got to tell the truth. We. I, I went down to the. I went down to the guest list area to see if one of my friends had arrived because we were given like a, like ten, five or ten spaces on the guest list. Okay. And um, we. We. I went down and um, there's a, a music journalist that wrote that writes or wrote for the enemy called Simon Williams. And I'd met him a few times and I, uh, we, we had friends in common and he, he was, he couldn't get in. He wasn't on the, on the, they, they messed up the guest list. Oh wow! And just as I'd gone to check the guest list and I said, Oh, we've got space on our guest list. And he said, oh, you're playing. I said, yeah, yeah, we, we're doing it. We're supporting. This, we're, the, we're on in about 15 minutes. So I got him in for nothing. Oh, nice. Um, uh, on the guest list. And the following week, there's a review of the Lush gig in the enemy <laughs> and the first pa- we get our first review and it's a paragraph in the enemy and it was just lovely oh just said really lovely things about us and i just thought that's very sweet of you simon you're a very nice person <laughs> and i know that's because i know that's because i got you in and you're just returning the favor um, <laughs> and so so it was our second only show we did. We played the the first gig in Windsor, just outside London, the the night before as a warm up, and so our second ever gig, it's our first London show, and we get a review, and um and then we got interest. Wow. You know, we had um we we had um uh in fact the night of the gig we had people coming up asking us if we had a manager and if um this is a, I work for such and such a label and blah blah blah. Jeez. Um, honestly. We were we had so much luck at the beginning. Well, um, I have a, it dried up. I, <laughs> 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 Within months, but you know. all right. So I have a question: How did you get the nickname Moose? Oh, that was when I was a student. Um, it was yeah. I started at that mom, I started my college course, and the student bar had a. They just had this selection of beers, but there was this new at the time beer called Moosehead which is like a just a I think a a Canadian lager or whatever and there's nothing it's nothing particularly fancy or whatever but it was cheap yeah Um, (laughs) and and so um, it was every time I went to the bar it was just be if someone was going to the bar what do you want to drink get me a Moosehead get me a Moosehead Moosehead became my nickname and then within weeks it was reduced to Moose (laughs) And that was it. And so it's um, a nickname I've had now for like 30, 33 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's so funny. There are there is lots of people that I've known for many years that don't know my name. That's a... They don't know my real name. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had people people come up to, I think, I'm sure people have come up to Mickey and say, what's his real name? <laughs> you know, for like a, for a birthday card or something like that. And it's like, no, 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 just put moves on the yeah. birthday card. Oh my God, but, that's hilarious. Then I thought I would lose the nickname when the band, uh, I, I, I was really against calling the band Moose because I thought, no. Um, <laughs> If it was a, if it were if it were a solo project, and I was a singer, then fair enough. Yeah, but, um, I'm just a guitarist and band. And but Ru- Russell was um, adamant that it was a really good name for a band, and I just thought no, any, <laughs> anything, anything, but but uh, but yeah, it, it was fine. We, the, it stuck as a band name, and it, and I haven't lost it as a nickname, so I'm I'm all right with that. Oh, see, I was afraid when I was asking you, like. It was from my childhood. I don't want to talk about it. So. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. no, it was. It was. It was just really just a real studenty, studenty nickname, and um, yeah, that stuck. Okay, so the first time I ever heard the band's music was on this uh, compilation, uh, the Strange Fruit compilation. Peel, so it's the Peel Sessions. Okay. And I think Hut had put it out. 
was it a load of hut artists yeah it was uh it was moose it was verve and i was an enormous and i still am an enormous verve fan i don't even i still don't even like to add the definite article in front of their name so it's called strange fruit the hut recordings the peel session so oh it also had uh smashing pumpkins on it and revolver of course yes i forgot that the pumpkins were on yeah they were on hut they were on hut in the uk Initially, I don't know whether they changed to Virgin at some point, but they, yeah. but their first, the first album, for sure. They will. Is, is it called Gish? Gish is the first one, Gish? and that was in the U.S. That was on Caroline Records. So okay, but all the singles that they came out and the little EPs were all hut over here. They're all imports, which was like the bane of my existence as a uh, teenager, early twenties in, in the nineteen nineties, because those were expensive. <laughs> You know, you, oh, yes. The, the, okay. You know, I'd pay as much for a single with a couple extra tracks on it as I would for the entire album. But yeah. I found if I liked a band, I became a completist. I wanted everything. And especially with bands like Pumpkins and, and Moose, Verve, you know, I, I found that a lot of the B-sides and all were just as wild and, and, and exciting as the album tracks. You know, they weren't just yes. throwaway songs. No, 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 no. Um, I mean, when we when we went into record EPs, I think um, we I'm pretty sure that we did three EPs before we we actually got in to do an album. And I I think at the time of recording, we never really knew which was going to be the main track, the one that we do a video for. Certainly, the first two EPs, it was. I'm, I'm pretty sure there was some. Well, it's such a long time ago now, but it, I'm sure there was discussion as to oh shouldn't shouldn't it be this why are we choosing that one and that that's that's not the lead track for me right. um, but i uh, i think we always kind of or i certainly i did i always bowed to what the, the advice that either the record company or management would say so you can't possibly have that as a single it's a it's slow it's a ballad it's got to be the up tempo one or you know that kind of thing and i always just went with with that advice so so when we were recording when we were recording those four track four song eps we didn't really know which one was going to be the lead ah. track yeah over here it the it was so hard to find moose stuff in fact the only thing i could find was the sunny and sam um which is the compilation of the eps yeah, yeah. Even then, I didn't get it because I couldn't afford it. <laughs> so the only thing right. I, the only thing I had was the uh, the Strange Fruit compilation, and I just listened to that over and over again because each of the bands on there was just amazing. And it was the only thing that I disliked about it was that the band I actually bought it for was Verve. And they only had one track on there, but oh, okay, it was okay because it had the Pumpkins, which I already had the Pumpkins track, but I got to hear you know Moose and Revolver. So I was like, all right, I'm going to just, I, I just kind of wear the CD out and I didn't have to skip anything because I knew I loved everything on it. So it was a great album to put on and just, I was a photography student at the time. Right. So I would, I would, uh, either I take the stereo into the uh, dark room, just put it on and just put repeat and just shoegaze stuff is just incredible to do dark room work, anything in the dark <laughs> with really. So I just in the developing film or, or, uh, making a print in, in complete blackness or with the red the red light on and it was just i don't know there's something about that album it, every time i put it on now I, i'm just brought back to being in college in a dark room you know i i don't have a copy i've never owned a copy of that and really? i don't think I, I don't think i've ever heard it oh wow I, now I'm going to have to try and find that now oh, because that's I mean I'm not I'm not a completist type of person. To be honest, I own I own less than half of our back catalogue. Wow! I don't even have a copy of our last album. Oh wow! Uh, yes. Well, here I'll tell you what. If you if you want to find a copy, if you go to Discogs 
I love Discogs. That's that's one of my favorite websites. They've got a copy of the Strange Fruit recordings. There's 29 of them for sale from $2.39 on a Oh wow. A, that's a bargain. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what shipping is, but let's see. You might be able to find one in the UK. Yeah, I probably will actually. I might have a look. To me that's that's pretty wild that that I don't know if that's common or not that that artists don't have a whole lot of their own recordings. That that to I, me is amazing. I've moved around a lot. Um uh -huh. and I've lent stuff out. Um, I, I'm, I, I never keep an eye on these things. Yeah. You know, you know, some someone will come up to me and say, "Oh, this, here's a book you lent me five years ago," and I think, <laughs> "Oh, shit!" You're right. <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 I completely forgot. So I kind of, I'm not particularly um, proprietorial about things. So I kind of, you know, I'm sure that that someone somewhere has got a guitar of mine or an effects pedal. You know, wow. I, I, I'm the exact um, opposite. My wife makes fun of me because I will. I will look. I've, I wish I could show you right now. My room's a mess, but behind me and around me, I have bins of of probably thirty five hundred to four thousand CDs. And oh. if if one of them is is missing, I just like feel it. It's, it's brilliant. You I, sense it in the room. <laughs> I, I do. My my kids will go and they'll come and borrow some of my stuff occasionally. They they know Dad's got a pretty extensive collection, so they'll come in and they'll browse through my stuff and I'll walk in the room and I'm like, something's different. What's wrong? Something's changed. I literally <laughs> had a cardboard single f uh, of Cigaros and I was doing something and I hadn't seen, I hadn't played it in years, but I started cataloging my CDs to keep track of them and I couldn't find it, but I knew I was missing it. I'm like, I don't know where this thing is. And my wife's like, you are ridiculous. I'm like, I know, I know, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I am the way I am. But I, 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 wanna, I do want to find out a little bit about the sound of Moose because an article about one of your shows really defined and named the shoegaze scene. However, mm. pretty soon after that, the sound evolved a lot and you guys did not sound shoegazy. No, no, there was a, I think we, when we first started, we, we thought, you know, th that we could do everything with guitars and um, effects. And I think what we were really aiming for was to, you know, write some nice songs that you could actually play on an acoustic. They were all written on an acoustic guitar. I mean, oh, wow. Okay. Kind of acoustically written. Um, so you could, you know, play them on a, on a I had the same 12 string. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in the house. It's somewhere in the house. I've, oh, I've wow. the, my, my old busking, I think it might be in the loft. It's uh, I've, In fact, it is in the loft. Um, <laughs> it's the 12 string that um, I used to go busking with. And most things were written on that 12 string guitar. Wow. Um, and hey, you mind if I uh, borrow that? I'll give it back to you in like five or six years. Yes. yes. <laughs> you, you, you'll never have to. <laughs> That's so weird because I was thinking, actually, where the hell is it? But I think it's in, in the loft. We got, I mean, you know, Mickey's got a ton of guitars in this house that, wow. are, you know, I mean, ridiculously collectible stuff. Um, I'm looking at some now; they're everywhere. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, the, the loft is full of them. But, but, but my old twelve string is up there, and oh, wow. um, so things were written on an acoustic guitar. Then we'd go into a rehearsal room. And we try and sort of, well, just trash it out, you know, and just suddenly you've got amps and effects pedals and yeah. we try to kind of like bring a bit of, because I think much as we like things like good good songwriting, whether it was Tim Buckley or Chris Christopherson or whoever, we still liked Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. And yeah. so there was an element of kind of wanting to harness that kind of, I mean, I was a massive fan of Dinosaur Jr., I have to say. I know. I, I, oh. I remember. I, I saw them a few times in the late eighties, and Christ, they just absolutely blew me away. I mean, maybe some of the best gigs I can remember. Uh, that, that they were so powerful. Yeah. And they they had songs. I mean, they just yeah. You know, uh, they were just. It, it wasn't they, just they, noise. No, oh God, no, no, no. There was that. There was a real feeling of like of um. I don't know what it was. They just. They had. They really had something. I saw them support. Um, this would have been about eighty, not eighty, 
2008, uh, when Daydream Nation came out, Sonic Youth came over and they yeah. did a couple of gigs in London and they had Dinosaur Junior supporting them. And it was staggering. Oh, honestly. man. That, honestly. Wow, what a noisy show. Oh, I mean, this was, uh, this is, uh, for me, it's peak Sonic Youth. Yeah. And, um, and Dinosaur just sounded, Dinosaur Junior just sounded uh, unbelievable. It was just a fantastic gig. And, yeah, it was 88, 89, that kind of time. Yeah. And um, so there was always an element of like wanting to write songs and but wanting to have that kind of noise and power and and but I think when we when we started writing for the first album, which I think we recorded in ninety two, we started writing the songs around the end of ninety one and into early ninety two. I started demoing them and I started just using just more acoustic instruments and adding some keyboard flourishes here and there. And we demoed a bunch of songs that, that re, where we'd kind of stripped it back a little bit. And then it was a question of finding the right producer because I think we, we didn't want to work with somebody who was going to go, okay, you're those guys that you're the shoegazy guys that want to be all pedals. Right. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that there were conscious conversations. It, it, it was a conscious decision. There were conversations where we talked about maybe like having something that was more beautiful and something less less noisy, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so we were looking at all kinds of people to produce. I, I remember um, wanting, oh God, the the, um, the 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 guy that produced um the rem album life's life's rich pageant which i, I think is their fourth album don fleming is it I, i'm gonna google this uh possibly i know he did a lot of work with screaming trees too oh, okay i'm sure that's his name i'm just gonna google it on my um on the google machine fleming american musician yes yeah, screaming trees sonic youth teenage fan club yeah okay oh wow yeah he's got well, a lot of stuff man Wow. Yes. I got it wrong. I got it wrong. It wasn't Don Fleming. It was Don Geeman. Don oh, Geeman. okay. So, oh God, my memory's going. So not not actually, when you look at his work, not quite so cool. <laughs> um, um, I'm not a fan of Hootie and the Blowfish. Oh, um, no. Um, neither am I a fan of, wow. <laughs> He's worked with Chicago. I'm Coffee iffy on that. Nash. That's cool. This can't be right. This must be right. No, no. It says he also produced Life's Rich Pageant. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that must be the most alternative thing he ever did in his life. Yeah. It <laughs> sounds like R.E.M. was trying to go Crosby, Stills, Nash with that album then. But it's, it's my favorite R.E.M. album, actually. Yes. <laughs> it's a, it's a, which is why we, we, we went looking for... So, oh, yeah. So that's it. Producers. And there was also... Um, so David Boyd, who was the head of Hut Records, the um, kind of A&R man, head of the subsidiary that is Hut, uh, he used to work out at the Virgin offices on the Harrow Road in London, but no, they had their own little floor. Okay. So, you know, but they, they kind of, they were, an, they were an independent offshoot. So there was always this idea that it was, it was a major label, but right. they had kind of indie credibility. Right, you know, yeah. Um, um, unless you were an indie purist, in which case they had no credibility yeah. at all. You know, <laughs> but, but except they were putting out, you know, Verve and Smashing Pumpkins, etc. Yeah. But he also suggested, and we went to see them. There's a band. There's, they're two brothers. They're kind of a bit crazy. I just can't remember what they're called. And in fact, maybe Don Fleming had something. That's where I'm getting Don Fleming from. Um, I will remember the name. They're two brothers. One of them plays bass. The other one sings. And we, I think David was interested in getting them to produce our record. Oh, do you remember? I hate myself. Yeah. <laughs> for not, for not, oh, one of their album sleeves is a pastiche. There's a Beatles album that only came out in America where they're all in white coats and they've yeah. got babies. Yeah, the butcher cover. The butcher cover. These two brothers have got um, an, an album sleeve that is a parody. This is a pop quiz now oh, for you, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's a B, B, not not Beezer, not not. Oh. oh my gosh, I can picture it. 
why yeah. oh i mean anyway so the, these guys these guys <laughs> whoever they were whoever they were um they were also suggested and um we went along to see them live at the underworld and they were um they were pretty out they're kind of an out there a bit kind of not as extreme as something like the butthole surfers but there's a, there's a certainly a kind of a surreal element to what they do but it, it was it was david boyd who, who ultimately suggested listen mitch easter never mind the guy that did the fourth rem album <laughs> get the guy that did the first the first two rem albums and, that's not um, bad either and and he was in a band called let's let's active um and he's from north carolina and i remember that yeah so mitch came over he flew over and he met us and we played him some demos and again it was one of those you know his record collection is the same as our record collection kind of thing yeah um and um he'd just been working with a band called super chunk super chunk oh yeah was, i like yeah. super chunk yeah and we went to see them play they played in london at the time we were recording so we went along to see them play he just produced their album and he was just a just a really lovely lovely person and a, a superb producer yeah and an amazing guy to work with in the studio and so he came to london stayed in london a few months and we recorded the first album and this is when we decided that we'd get strings real strings real hammond organ Wow. And I think that's when the sound changed. The first, the the first album proper, is we we kind of we we thought we were leaving something behind and moving on, and you know we did. things that i found so fascinating was that like you said you incorporate all these different sounds organs and strings and this is that album was what nine came out 92 two, 92 yeah so yeah. that's several years before a lot of the other bands in the shoegaze scene at that point started to incorporate that kind of thing you know verve did it in in uh what 95 on history and a couple of tracks on, on Northern soul, but you know, even Oasis and, and, and even just non shoegaze bands, alternative bands that they started to incorporate acoustic songs and, you know, bands that were known for being heavier and, and yeah. dreamier even didn't really incorporate this. As you guys going, looking back on it to me, one of the really early in, uh, bands to incorporate sounds that you don't, normally uh, associate with shoegaze dream pop alternative yeah, music absolutely i think it was in a way i think it was you know when we were working with mitch it was the idea that we we were maybe trying to capture something of a late 60s early 70s sound and we thought you know when you've got someone like mitch easter who knows how to get that sound i think i think it was a there was a real like I say, it was it was it wasn't an accident. Okay. It was it was it was something that we we really wanted to do. We really wanted to make it sound like something, I suppose, timeless. But the, the problem with that is that it's not because I mean, my favorite band, my favorite record of all time is Forever Changes by Love. It's my I, I, ah. I, 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 it, it's Love is just it, it, that's just a beautiful record with strings and brass and yeah. you know and harmonies and it's and you know we were listening to things like pet sounds as well lots of beach boy stuff holland and um the, the late 60s and early 70s beach boy stuff and i think we were trying to maybe go for a bit of that uh, go for a bit of that sound did and, you guys think that was more of a, of a risk based on uh what was popular at the time yes it was it was a risk and but we just thought maybe the songs will be enough that the, the fact that yes it's it's a cleaner slightly more retro sound but yeah. we thought you know maybe the songs will be strong enough for it to be um you know for, for that not to matter but but we never really got the chance to <laughs> to find out because we got you know, about three months after the album came out we were dropped so um so that what 
what I thought was really cool, and I didn't realize it until researching everything, is that Dolores O'Riordan plays with you guys. I mean, and this was before the Cranberries debut album comes out. Did you know her from the scene or? No, no. What happened was, um, and it's so sad as well, because she was such a sweetheart. Yeah. Um, we were going off to do our, it was our second tour. You know, every time we released an EP, we did a, a little UK tour of about 10, 15 dates up to Scotland and up to Manchester and Newcastle and places like that playing to tiny, tiny audiences. Honestly, outside of London, nobody came to see us, really. <laughs> you know, if we got 100 people at a show, it was it was a result. Oh. You know? <laughs> and, um, and believe me, um, that didn't happen very often. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so our, it was our second tour for the Cool Breeze EP, which had Suzanne. We'd, done a, we'd just done a, a video for that, and we went out on, on tour, and the Cranberries had just come over they were they were 16 17 years old wow. they were i mean i think she was 17 there, there, there was there was nobody in that band that was actually in their 20s at the time they were all 18 17 18 19 that kind of age group um two brothers and they were just from really close knit uh, small town in ireland um a re- you know really really uh, off the beaten track kind of place yeah. but you know they had a they had a, a demo that that had attracted a lot of attention. They had a manager. She had an astonishing voice. Yeah. Uh, and they had some lovely, gentle songs. And uh, they were signing to Ireland. They think they signed to Ireland. And we almost signed to Ireland. We knew the guy there. And um, he persuaded our manager to um, say, Moose are going out on the road. The Cranberries, they've never played outside of Ireland before. Just would they take them round? Look after them, make yeah. sure everything's okay, and be nice. Don't be too <laughs> drunken and, and horrible. Yeah, they're still um, teens. Yeah, they're, and 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 they were they were delightful. They were. I mean, she, there's so many stories written about her yeah. and her shyness. You know, singing with her back to the audience. You know, she was just petrified. Yeah. Um, and I don't blame her. I mean, the fact that she was on tour with Moose meant that she was singing with her back to no audience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, she, if she had taken the trouble to turn around, she'd have realised the only people the only people watching her were us. Um, but and you know, you know, an old man and a dog. But <laughs> it was it, no, I, I kid you not. Some of those some of those shows uh, that we, we played on that. But it, I, I'm not, I'm, almost embarrassed, I'm embarrassed for them. Oh, the cramp, okay. you know. Cranberries had to go on, and and we we just couldn't we couldn't seem to pull a crowd outside of London and maybe Manchester and Glasgow somewhere like that. Played to really small crowds, yeah. <laughs> but um, so we we knew her, and I think we did. A, there was another gig, and I'm again I I have to check. I don't keep a diary or anything anything like that. Mickey keeps a diary of everything, so you uh-huh. know. She knows every gig that she's ever been to, and blah oh my blah blah. Gosh, um, yeah, she would tweet about that. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, she, you know, if you if you if you ask her, did you ever see blah blah blah, she said yes eight times <laughs> on the fourteenth of January, on the fourteenth of January, nineteen eighty four. I saw them support blah blah blah. Oh um, wow! But um, so I, I I don't really have a record. It's all it's all in my head. Yeah, I, um, I try to do that too, but because uh, my brother swears that we we saw Oasis in Atlanta at the Tabernacle in like mid nine, mid to late nineties out in Atlanta. And I don't remember that at all. I know he went, I don't remember being right. there. He swears I was there. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't, I don't drink that much. I'm not that big of an alcoholic, but I don't remember but if it. You're, if you're going to lots of gigs. I mean, they, they, they all blur into one sometimes, don't they? They yeah. do. And I, I used to keep all my ticket stubs. And if there was yeah. a, a, uh, like an opening act that wasn't on the stuff. I try to write it down. So I would remember, I just actually recently came across it there. I put them all in a sandwich bag because I was I'm moving around a lot and I didn't want them to get ruined. And I recently just found them and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I remember this show. Like, I, and, and Holy crap. Like I, there was a, one of my favorite shows was a band morphine and a band called 16 horsepower opened up. I actually went to go see 16 horsepower, not morphine. So it was just, I had forgotten that I actually it was morphine that was the headliner. I I remember seeing sixteen horsepower, but we played with morphine. Oh, really? Hang on a minute. Did they? Oh, was it codeine? Oh, hang on. No, 
did Morphine have a sax player? Yeah, Dana Colley. A, 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 a bass player that sang, who, who sadly passed away. Mark Sandman, yeah. We played in Brussels with them. We played a gig in Brussels. Oh, wow. Yeah. They were one of the weirdest bands I think I've ever seen. I've never seen yes. anything like it, to be honest. No, the guy, he played like a weird slide bass kind of a sound. And Dana Colley, yes. Dana Colley he, he would play two saxophones at the same two time. Saxophones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Like Roland Kirk or something yeah. like that. It was just like, just, but it was, yes. And it, but it wasn't just a, a, a gimmick. I mean, he could actually do it, which was incredible. No, no, no. Ab absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. They were, um, that was, they were pretty insane, actually. That... Um, yes, morphine. No. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I was trying to remember. Um, we played with the Cranberries again. The House of Love did... Um, they did this thing where they did three gigs, three shows in one day in London. Oh, they wow. did a, an afternoon show, kind of like evening kind of thing. Then they went and played uh, a big show at the Town and Country Club, the Forum. And then they played a late night kind of clubby show, uh, like going on the stage at 11 o'clock or half 11. Oh, so wow. they did three three shows in one night and we played the middle show, which was at the Forum. And I'm absolutely certain the cranberries are on that bill as well i think it was the cranberries us and house of love and so by then we we'd got to know them and i i think i moved down to i moved to wales for a while and i remember the cranberries turned up they played a gig down in newport and they just crossed that line into becoming famous uh -huh. they were they they arrived in this this tour bus that was one of those kind of I think they'd just been playing some big show in Germany. Yeah. And I think it was either just before or just after they they hit the big time in America. And I went along to the gig and I had a chat with Dolores before the show. And she obviously this is now three years on from when she was this really shy girl that couldn't face it and she yeah. she was transformed yeah it was a it was a you know so confident and you know same band yeah. same three guys backing her the, but yeah so i think we asked if we got in touch with the record company and said would dolores be happy to sing this is what we were talking about sorry we're right oh yeah um, no on, X, on xyz <laughs> um and she came in and um she did two tracks she did two songs. Oh. Um, one of them ended up on the album. didn't now i lobbied for that to be the other track to be on the album because it was actually i think it was my favorite song that we did in the whole sessions oh, and, wow. but we never i don't think we even mixed it i think we did a rough mix it was decided that ah uh, we it's not it's not for this album and it was it was quite a country song actually it was like there was no hiding from the fact that it was it sounded like a country ballad and wow. but it, i really loved it, it had a beautiful trumpet solo and um and we never we that was it it's gone wow i mean, I mean it'd be nice if we could dig it up for the box set because yeah because wow. it would be um you know it was it was it, it was such a beautiful track but like I said, it never got mixed it was only ever a rough board mix of it and so we never got around to giving it the full treatment oh um, gosh but it but it still sounded lovely as as it was um, that would Wow, that would be yeah. a, a gem if you could find that. Jeez. Yeah, I know. Well, it, it's somewhere. Yeah. It, it exists. It, it exists in the vaults, as I mentioned, in the dusty vaults. Yeah. Some, <laughs> some Somebody's corporate basement. record company basement. Yeah. yeah. So yeah they, if it hasn't been destroyed. Oh, well, yeah. Now, you mentioned country. There is a huge country influence in Moose's music moving forward. There's no hiding. Yeah. No. I didn't. And like I said, you know, Moose music. Moose music, that sounds... Moose's music was hard to find over here, especially, I guess, where I was, maybe. 
So I didn't realize until going back and, and listening again how prevalent the country sound was. Was that something that yeah. you guys were going to it on purpose or was that just your influences coming out? I think it was the influences coming out. I think, <laughs> like, yes, yeah, 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 country and Irish. Yeah. I mean, I think um, the, like I, like I said, even the very first songs w- were written on a 12-string acoustic guitar. Yeah. Um, and you could play them like that, but I suppose we kind of, you know, like I said, when, once we went into uh, into a rehearsal room um, and start, you know, r- brutalizing them with distortion, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think we were really finding our feet on those first three EPs. We're just sort of like scrabbling around and enjoying what we were doing, doing gigs and having a bit of fun. But I think when, you know, when we did the first album, I, there was, there was a real feeling that like, um, you know, let's, let's be a bit serious. Let's make sure we get this right. Okay. Um, because, you know, I mean, you, you only get to do your first album once, of course. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure that it was, it was something that, you know, that we'd be able to listen to and, and just be happy with, you know, forever really. And, um, yeah, so it, it's it, it was like I say it was great working with with Mitch. It was great having strings and brass and and all kinds of stuff and and Dolores having you know like we had a friend who played Hammond organ and he had the proper he had a Hammond organ and Leslie speakers uh. and we we went and we had them all delivered to the studio um, and he came along and he played organ on a couple of tracks and. It was it was oh, it was a, such a fantastic time. I, I look back and I think we had a, an absolute ball making that record. It was it was really lovely. And Mitch was a it is I guess still a smashing guy. Yeah. Um, and um, I I don't know what we we never said in touch with him. I know that we may or may not have annoyed him <laughs> by in the, in the fact that that he mixed the album and then there was a couple of songs that where we thought oh. I, th- I think I d- we won't have later. We thought that if we need to change the mix on that, and we mi- we remixed it ourselves. And uh, <laughs> maybe, it was, maybe maybe Mitch M- Mitch's mix was absolutely fine, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what, what what he ever thought about that. The album had been out about three months, two or three months, and um, we we did a a little UK tour. We went off to France with Ride. We supported Ride in, in France, which was really lovely. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Wow. That, was, that would have been a cool show. It was. It was really excellent. We had, Man. again, we had such a nice time. It was off. We played in Paris and we'd done a few little one-off gigs, but we'd never actually done a proper around France tour. And we did a couple of gigs in Spain as well on that tour. Uh, so it was our first time in Madrid and Barcelona. But yeah, it was uh, it was really really good fun. It was all se- it all seemed to be going well, and then and then Virgin said, "Good night, Vienna." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was uh, uh, it was um, it, there was a massive cull. I think I can't remember who took over. I think I think maybe EMI took over Virgin. Somebody took over Virgin that autumn and just looked at their roster of artists and thought, "You've got too many artists on this roster," wow. um, and um, some some of them. Uh, some of them aren't, are never going to get anywhere. Some of them spend too much money. Some of them are old hats. So, you know, we got, I, I, I remember we got, um, we got dropped the same day as the Mock Turtles. I don't know if you remember a band called the Mock yes. Turtles. Yes, they, they do. got dropped and Public Image Limited. They also, yes. Wow. So, I mean, how, how dare you? I mean, you can, you can drop us. Yeah. We don't mind, but how are you doing dropping pill? Uh, that's... Well, that's just, that was ridiculous. Wow. And, uh, you know, and I used to think like, you think someone's come in here. They they just taken a scissors and just started slashing at things and um, almost alec- uh, alphabetically. We'll go from M down. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah, half the alphabet's a- gone. Yeah, A to K were fine. Yeah. They just you know yeah yeah, and, uh, but that that just meant that we just thought, what do we do now? We we'd started writing some. We, we had a couple of new songs. And we thought, shit, we were expecting to maybe be in the studio doing a new album next year. And, yeah. um, well, we were. I mean, we did. Yeah. Um, uh, but we, we put out an EP on our own label. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, just, a, I think, a three-track EP called, uh, I think it's called Li- Liquid Makeup EP.
again, I don't have a copy of that. <laughs> and, well, um, I have, there are 12 for sale on Discogs from $4.82 <laughs> okay. on up. <laughs> okay, that's cool because because not very many were pressed and oh, really? uh, not very many were sold. Oh. Um, but the thing is, we just thought, well, we'll just do it. You know, we just. I think it's always a shame if a band gets dropped and they they just suddenly think, well, we don't exist anymore. Let's just, you know, a few people told us, oh, you just break up and you know form other bands. Yeah, and it was, uh, you know, you you had your moment. It didn't work out. And um, wow. And you know, and it, you know, that's defeatist. A, yeah, well, we did have a really quite a brutal conversation with um, uh, a guy that that used to manage us, um, and you know, he did say, you know, that the thing with the music industry, and he said it's a cliche, but there's a lot of throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. And he said you didn't stick, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> which. Which I, it was quite upsetting, but uh, but to be to have your music described in those terms, yeah, I can but, but, but you know, on a brutal level, he was he was absolutely correct. You know, yeah. it's a, it is a, an industry or a business at the end of the day. Yeah, um, you can get too romantic about these things. No, and you know, stick. like you said, pill didn't stick either after a point. After 1992, no, yeah. they didn't. I don't know what they'd done wrong, but um, <laughs> uh, well, okay. Probably they, not releasing anything in a while was probably their their, their problem. But that's, um, yeah. So we did our EP, and then it was a guy called Peter Kent, who uh, an English guy that worked in Brussels. He worked for Play It Again, Sam. He worked for um, he worked for their publishing arm. The publishing arm of Play It Again, Sam, and he liked it. He liked the EP, and he said. Um, are you doing an album? And we, we'd already got a little deal with the guy that where we recorded our first album, where we recorded X Y Z. We spent so much money on that. On well, actually, no, no. By our standards, it was a lot of money. Right. By other by other band standards, it was nothing. But um, we spent a, and we recorded all our EPs there. And the okay. guy that owned the studio felt that we'd been treated a bit harshly. So he said, if you want to record your next album. You haven't got a record deal, but you can come in when the studio is empty. You can come in on downtime. You know, for example, I've got I've got a week coming up. You can come in for a week, and wow. then he was wonderful. That's amazing. Um, I mean, like I say, there's there's been a lot of you know whether it's Emma sending out our first demos and offering us our first gigs. Yeah. And, you know, for every asshole out there that wants to you know <laughs> watch your shit slide down the <laughs> wall, um, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Um, there's always going to be there's plenty of plenty or, of nice people. You know? Or literally, um, you don't know what people are into. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, um, but he so we were able to record a whole uh, the whole second album, Honey Bee, and we recorded that for you know I'd like to say peanuts, but you know nine thousand pounds isn't peanuts, but it was r really super cheap. Still, at the time. yeah. You know that that's that was that was a bargain, but we ha we didn't have a deal. And he said, "When you get your deal, you can pay me." So if wow. you put it out on your own label, you put it on your own label, pay me when the money starts coming in. And so it was really really sweet of him to do that's that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but the thing is, it, it then gave us we had, had an album, yeah, finished, mixed, recorded, and um, Peter. All the, all the heavy lifting's done at that point. It, it is because we're not trying to get money to record an album. Yeah. We've now got our second album done and dusted. And Peter Kent, the publishing guy from Play Again Sam, he said, Well, listen, I'm I'm gonna offer you a publishing deal. I think I think it's great. And I think, you know, we can get some funding here. It might help the, the publishing money might pay for the um the, the recording costs. Right. And, and a little advance like that. And we thought, this is this is great. We'll put it out on our own label. Um but he then suggested that perhaps if the, the record was to come out on Play It Again Sam's, uh, not just the publishing, on the actual record company side, I'll speak to my colleagues. We'll see if you can release it on Play It Again Sam. And you don't have to do any, have any worry about trying to sort out your own record label. And, um, you have to worry about distribution. Yes. You have to jump through all those hoops. Yeah. And there's a lot of admin involved. And if, if you're like us, and at the time, you know, it, it's actually a, an absolute miracle that we released a, 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 a one EP on our own label <laughs> before that. Because, but no, actually, I, I say that, I say a miracle. it's not a miracle. You know, R Russell's a very well-organized guy and he's, you know, he's pretty cool at stuff like that. So we decided to play against them. And um, that, the, the, the second album came out. I'm happy when I'm
there was a long delay before the next one came out because play against them um, uh, i'll be honest with you they, they they weren't the easiest people to deal with and we had a few regrets about not doing it on our own label really? and yeah they were they, they, i don't want to slag them off because i'm not bitter and twisted <laughs> <laughs> anymore <laughs> but, but no no we, we we went through we went through a difficult phase with them where we recorded we started recording this uh, then what it was our third album and um second album with them i don't think they were too happy with how the, with the sales for the for honeybee 